My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello, and welcome to the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a brand new optimizer, I welcome you and I sincerely hope that you enjoy today's conversation. If you are inspired to take action after listening today, why not tell a friend about this show and help spread the love? And if you're a longtime listener and optimizer OG, welcome back. Whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned vet, if you have just 10 seconds today, it would mean the world to me if you clicked the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice because the more people that subscribe, the more that iTunes and the other platforms can recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. And now on to today's show. Isn't it amazing how global pandemics, worldwide protesting and riots, and the general upheaval of society as we know it happens to just make you think? It certainly helps lend a little perspective on what is really important in life and the choices we have made that led us to where we are right now at this moment. One of the most important realizations that I have had is that because of travel restrictions and both of my parents being in the highest risk category for the COVID virus, I have no way of seeing them in person again until there is either a reliable vaccine or we reach herd immunity. So at this point, that could honestly be months or even years. And for a long time now, I have wanted to sit down and do an interview with my father to ask him the big questions about life that we seldom, if ever, really discuss. So for this Father's Day, I decided it was time to prioritize this conversation, even if it meant having to suffer through the perils of recording on Zoom as opposed to chatting face-to-face. And I will apologize in advance. There are going to be some dropouts here and there. I apologize for that. Now, I just want to make it very clear that this episode is a very special and personal one that I recorded for me. I didn't record it for social media shares. This is not about search engine optimization. This is not about growing an email list. This one is for me. But my hope is that listening to today's conversation inspires you to reach out to your parents, if you're fortunate enough that they are still alive, or your siblings, or those who helped shape the person that you are today, so you can have an honest conversation with them just like this one. This is the first of a two-part interview where I have created a series of 20 specific questions that I am calling 20 questions to ask your father on Father's Day, which you can, of course, repurpose to suit your own needs. These questions were inspired by a similar exercise from high-performance coach Brendan Bouchard, and I linked all of those 32 questions that he has in a Facebook post in the show notes for this episode. So if you would like the same questions word for word that I asked in the first part of this interview, just go ahead and visit the show notes at optimizeyourself.me slash episode 108. So without further ado, part one of my conversation with my father, Al Arnold. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspirational interview, you know where to go. Go ahead and visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. I am here today with Al Arnold. And no, it's not a coincidence that he just happens to have the same last name as mine. We are talking today to my dad. So, dad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So this uh, this interview has been roughly 40 years in the making and certainly actually a lot more than 40 years in the making once we uh, we jump into the questions. The the purpose of this interview to be perfectly honest with my audience This one isn't about my audience today. This one is just going to be about us, and this is me being perfectly selfish, wanting to get this interview in the can. I'm hoping that my audience sees this as an exercise that they can do with their dad for Father's Day or otherwise. They can do it with their mom. So this is going to be a little bit off the beaten path of the way that I usually do things. Generally, I like to come to my conversations completely unprepared with no questions and just talk and have a general theme or idea, but just have a conversation. But today, I have 20 very specific questions. And these 20 questions are questions that I have 
collected together based off of an exercise that inspired me several years ago when I began the the shift and the transformation and my life from one path to a very, very different one. Um, an early mentor uh, was a, a coach and a teacher. His name is uh, Brendan Burchard. And he had this exercise that he shared one day on Facebook that was the 32 questions that everybody should ask their dad. And I said, oh, this sounds like a great idea. And I bookmarked it. And one of the things that I inherited from you in spades is my ability to procrastinate. So I've had this bookmarked for like three years now where I've wanted to do this exercise. And as I'm sure you can relate to, there's always something else that comes up that always gets in the way. And when the the world starts to fall apart and there's global pandemics and there's riots and there's burning in the streets, you start to look at things through a slightly different lens and realize what's truly important. This is something that's been important to me for a long time, and I decided I just needed to clear my calendar and I needed to make this happen. So the idea is that I have these 20 questions. I'm going to share all 20 of these questions in a PDF file that my audience can use if they want to be able to ask the same questions of somebody as well. And it's broken down into four categories. So we have things that are just general about your life and your background and growing up. We have some questions specifically about your career. We have questions specifically about family life. And we just have questions about life in general, the, the big picture and the meaning of life and all that good stuff. So this one, this, this could be a heavy conversation, but I know that you and I are no stranger to heavy conversations. So we're just going to go ahead and we're going to jump in and we're going to get started. And I'm probably going to be done talking for the next 90 minutes to two hours. And now it's going to be all you. So I'm going to talk a lot less than I usually do on these podcasts um, because I I really want you and your story to be the star of this one. So we're literally just going to start with the beginning. And question one is, when were you born? Where? And what memories come to mind when you think about growing up as a young child? I was born in 1941 in Edgerton, Wisconsin. I'm assuming that there are, uh, there are some memories that come to mind when you think about growing up as a child that go beyond just being born in Edgerton in 1941, yeah? So well, what, are some of the, what are some of the fonder memories that you have of growing up as a child in Edgerton? The, the major memory I have of growing up from the time that I have a memory is certainly being a farm kid. Uh, I knew I was on a farm and I thought everybody was on a farm and that was life, but it was a very poor rural farm. We certainly didn't have very much. It was back in the day uh, when we didn't have telephones or radios or televisions. And uh, one of my one of my earliest memories is actually an exciting day of bringing some electricity to our home. The first time we had had electricity. And I was I was no longer a, a young a little kid. I was actually uh, I was actually a pretty good sized kid when they finally brought telephone service to us. I remember some uh, some milestones. I remember the purchase of a tractor so that we could do some work on the farm with the tractor instead of Colonel and Queen, the two horses that we had that did everything. I remember. I really didn't know much. I didn't know much about the war. I was a young lad uh, during the during the Second World War, but I was too young to really understand or know much about the the war. But I do remember. I do remember that our tractor had iron wheels. There weren't any. wasn't any such thing as a rubber tires. It had iron lugs, iron wheels on it. And I remember. Uh, being told that the reason we had the iron wheels on our tractor is because there was no rubber available because it was needed for the war effort. So I, I, I did understand that there was a war going on, and that's why we didn't have rubber tires on our tractor. So as a, a quick follow-up to that before we go to the next question, just so people have some semblance of a picture of Edgerton and what it looks like, it's, it's going to be quite foreign for a lot of the people that are listening to this. So um, Edgerton was, was the big city compared to where you actually grew up on a farm in a place called Newville. So just give me a very brief picture for somebody that, uh, that doesn't really understand this environment. Just go ahead and paint that for me. Okay. But when I talk about being born and growing up in Edgerton, uh, we, that was our address. Uh, our home address was Edgerton, Wisconsin. But Edgerton was about five miles away, and it was a town of a a number of hundreds of people. 
And we didn't get there very often because we lived out in the real country, uh, about five miles away from Edgerton. And when things when things were really exciting and happened, uh, we sometimes got into Edgerton to buy some groceries or to buy some things. So, so it was a big treat. It was a big day when we got to go into the big city of Edgerton of a few hundred people and uh, buy the groceries. And that was kind of a, it was kind of a Friday night thing, I guess. I guess it was what you did on Friday night is you, you drove into town to buy the groceries. And what had happened was uh, my mother had collected the eggs for the week from all of the chickens. And she drove with all of her eggs into the grocery store. And the eggs that she'd collected for the, for the week, why well, she traded in for the groceries. And back in those days, uh, she could take the eggs she had saved for the, for the week and take it in and trade them in. And she would come home with groceries and some money. So she had more than enough, she had more than enough uh, money from the eggs to, so she didn't have to pay for the groceries and came back with some money. Well, it's probably no uh, no coincidence then that the the story I often tell about my upbringing is fairly similar. Um, it's not Edgerton or Newville, um, but when I explain to people in uh, the big city of Los Angeles where I grew up, and I say a small town, they say, "Oh yeah, I grew up in a small town too. It was only like thirty or forty thousand people." And like, huh? Well, that town was sixty five miles away from where I grew up. And for us on Fridays and Saturdays, you went to the big town of Ladysmith, which was all of three thousand people. And the, the closest stoplight from our farm where you are at this moment, where I grew up, I believe the closest stoplight is either Thorpe or Ladysmith. So we're talking a minimum of 15 to 20 miles just to see a red light, um, to see a subway eatery. So j- just to, to, to paint the picture, it's, it's very, very similar to the story I tell. And it's probably no coincidence that that's where, uh, where you ended up. But there's a lot of stuff that happened in between there, and we're, we're going to get to all of that. Um, so the, the, the that, next that- – and that and that hasn't changed. No, uh, not at all. It, it's it, it it's it's still twenty one miles to the to the nearest stoplight. And it uh, that's the one nice thing about growing up there is that every time I go back, it's exactly the same as it was when I left uh, after high school. And most people can't say that. Most people will go back to where they grew up, and it's completely different, and all the buildings are different, and this is bought out, and it's grown, and it's expanded. And nope, I basically uh, grew up in a time capsule. I get to drive back there, and it looks exactly the same as when I left. So I guess that's in in my case, selfishly, that's a good thing for the sake of growth and prosperity. Maybe not such a good thing, but um, anyway. Uh, so the the next question, uh, the next in this uh, this list of these twenty questions, is going back to your childhood, thinking about who you have become today, and what it is that you do, and what you're the most passionate about. What are the most formative memories or experiences that you have? as either a child or a teenager that you think formed you to become the person that you are today doing what you do? Well, that's a tough question. There are a lot of things uh, that influence. One of the things that uh, influenced uh, the direction my life took was I had some, I actually was fairly sickly. I had uh, a lot of allergies, severe allergies. I eczema and asthma, and we lived on a farm and that was kind of tough because our, our living was made with farm animals. And I was allergic to all of the farm animals. So I couldn't be in the barn where I was allergic to cows. And I couldn't be near the horses because I was allergic to horses. And so it was found out in the allergy testing that I, the only animal that I wasn't allergic to was sheep. So my parents decided that if I was going to be on the farm and be productive, I was going to have to have sheep. So they put me in the sheep business. And I went into the sheep business when I was 10 years old. And my father gave me my own barn and building to take care of the sheep in and started me out with a flock of sheep and basically made me uh, 100% responsible for everything that happened, that everything was done with the sheep. And so I I was literally in business as a sheep man. Uh, when I was 10 years old and was involved in 4-H and showing sheep at 4-H fairs and so forth and uh, making whatever money and spending money I had with my own responsibilities. I re- I remember uh, being taught responsibility when I went into the sheep business. Why I was uh, 
had to get my own checking account. So they opened a checking account for me. And I, when I went to town to buy something for the sheep or for, for my enterprise, why people would look at me kind of funny at 10 years old, I could hardly reach up over the counter to hand them a check. But I knew people in town and they knew me. So as long as, as, long as people knew who I was, why my check was good. I was in business with my, my sheep business, my own checking account at 10 years old. And the, the other thing that I remember uh, that has stuck in my mind and has influenced me significantly in my entire life is that my father said to me, he said, and he was very, very proud of this. He said, uh, he said I could go into any store in town and tell them I didn't have any money with me and uh, buy something and uh, tell people that I, I would pay them later. And that would be fine. Everybody knew who I was and everybody trusted me and everybody knew that you could count on his word. And he said, that's the most important thing in life. He said, he said, I wouldn't actually do it. He said, but I'm very proud that I could, that uh, I could ask, ask for somebody to give me something without paying for it. And they would because they know who who I am, and they know my reputation, and everybody trusts me. Well, I would certainly say that that lesson has trickled down for sure. Um, uh, I don't know if I can walk into any store in Los Angeles and have the same experience. A little bit different playing field, but um, that that lesson of uh, your word meaning everything and following through with commitments has, has definitely trickled down to me and now trickling down to your grandchildren as well. You may have already stolen the answer to my next question, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If, uh, if you've already answered this, then you can answer it with the, the next thing down the line. Um, but what is the most important lesson that you learned from your father? Is it this one or is there another one you can think of that could go alongside of it? Probably it might be a theme in variations, but it really is the same thing that, that the only thing that matters in life is your reputation and basically how you treat people that you treat people right, you're always honest, and it will be returned. So, so it, is a, it is a variation on the, your whole life is really your reputation that you establish and what kind of person you are and how you treat people. Well, this is, uh, this is not going to be in the, the official formal questions, but given everything that's going on in the world right now, I do want to have a, a quick follow-up. And I want to define the people that deserve this respect because you uh, grew up in uh, Wisconsin, very red, very conservative state. I did as well. And there are, uh, there are certain beliefs, you know, both sides of the, the issue right now. Uh, but there, there's a very deep and clear lesson that I learned from you that I'm sure you learned from your parents about which of the people it is that we're supposed to respect and, uh, and treat as, as equals. For the most part, it's everybody. I mean, uh, I, I, uh, I certainly treat everybody with respect. And in some cases, uh, I treat a lot of people with respect who someone could argue don't deserve that respect. And in some cases, that influences them and makes a difference. And others, uh, it doesn't make any difference. But it's, it's, I, I, I really don't stop and think, do I treat this person with respect because they deserve it or be, or don't treat them. I just treat everybody with respect and, and hope they reciprocate. And if they don't, why, that, that's their problem. But at least I did my part and I treat everybody right. Well, this might be jumping ahead in my questions a little bit, but there's a, there's a story that you and I have been talking about that's very timely to everything going on, that it's one thing to say that you're going to treat everybody equally and with respect. It's another to follow through with it. And it's even another to follow through with it when it's not the popular and is maybe even a dangerous way to do so. Um, so talk to me and talk to my audience about the story of uh, both what you did in Jacksonville, Florida, when you were uh, in the Navy, as well as the, the first school that, not the first school, but one of the schools that you began that has a lot to do with all the, the political issues around equality right now. Now, that's a very interesting question relating to my growing up. Because I grew up in about the whitest uh, society that would be possible. Uh, it wasn't that I was taught anything or saw anything about people of a different religion or a different race or different creed or anything. Everybody was the same. Everybody was a, a pure white farmer. 
in Edgerton, Wisconsin, and I don't think I don't think I even knew what a a black person was uh, until I was quite old. And we we lived, oh, I guess, about 30, 40 miles from a town called Beloit, uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, that did have some black people in it. And I remember, for some reason, we drove to Beloit one day, and uh, I, I saw some some black children out, and I was just I was like, what is this? I had no idea what it was. I had been so ingrained in me that you treat everybody the same, you treat everybody right, that it never, it never occurred to me that it was just interesting and exciting to see somebody that looked different than I was. And, but I just thought that's, that's just, by, this was a great day. I found out there's other people in the world. They don't all look like me. And so, so I carried on with the idea that everybody should be treated the same, no matter what their color or creed, and continued that as a young man. After high school, I went into the service. I was in the Navy, and I was actually uh, on an aircraft carrier, CBA-64, the Constellation, and we were stationed in uh, Florida, pulled into Jacksonville, Florida. And this would have been about 1961 and went into town on Liberty and went into a a restaurant and walked into the restaurant. And I had never, I didn't know such a thing existed. And I couldn't believe it. It, the, The restaurant was like a mirror image. It was split down the center and the two sides were identical with one counter on one side and one on the other. And it had a sign up between the two sections where it said white section and uh, black section. And I thought, well, what? I, I, I couldn't believe this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I never heard of such a thing. Certainly had a lot of uh, black sailors on the ship with me and wasn't aware that they actually made people sit in different parts in the restaurant. Well, I thought, well, I'm, I don't really think this is, makes any sense at all. I'm not going to have anything to do with this. So I actually, I actually went over and said, it doesn't make any difference what color I am. I actually went over and went around the, on the site that it said for the blacks and sat over there just to show them I thought that was a dumb idea and I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And then uh, a little bit later in my life, uh, after I got out of the service, I was actually a school teacher and a school principal in a, a, a private actually a a religious school, and uh, I was principal of a religious school in Warren, Ohio, and the church that I went to and the school that we had in Warren, Ohio was all white. Wasn't a black person in it. Everybody was as white as I was. Didn't think too much about it, but, but then I found out that there was a a black church in Youngstown, Ohio, I forget, maybe 30 miles away or something. And I thought, well, this is dumb. Uh, We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be religious people. Everything that we taught and learned as part of a church and being part of a religion, separating the black people and the white people didn't make any sense to me. So I went to work and started working with the black church and the school in Youngstown. And uh, actually gave a number of talks, or you might even call them sermons, on the, uh, on the mor- in the morning for church, and talked to people in the, both places into forgetting about segregation. And we actually actually built a new school halfway between uh, Warren and Youngstown, and integrated integrated uh, the two schools. And so I was actually became principal of a school halfway between Youngstown and Warren that was uh, into, which was which was a big deal at the time and integrated the school and was a principal of a school it was roughly half white kids and white black kids 
needless to say, without going into too much detail, because I want to make sure we, we stick with some of these questions, but I would imagine that neither of these decisions, whether it was uh, sitting in the colored section of a segregated restaurant in Florida or starting a, a school where it integrates both uh, both races at the, the time, I would guess that neither of these were popular options or even necessarily safe decisions to make. Uh, well, I was I was pretty naive. Uh, no, that's not true. I wasn't pretty naive. I was very naive. I thought, well, I thought, well, this just this just makes sense. Any anybody that's a decent person, and we were talking about church going people, Christian people, and we, I thought, well, gee, it, it just makes sense. Who who could who could complain about this? And so, to my surprise, uh, some of those good church going folk on both sides, both the white. And the black, I found out they didn't think that was such a good thing to do, and they weren't too happy with me. In fact, some folks were quite unhappy with me for integrating the, the white church and the black church and, and starting integrated schools. So, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I kind of got a, I got an early education about just because it makes sense and it's right by uh, some people just aren't going to go along with it. Well, what, what I do find interesting, and again, this is uh, kind of a one additional follow-up, but uh, you and I have spent years and years, possibly most of my life, and I don't even remember how early back this goes, but this idea of scripts running in our head and uh, guiding a lot of the decisions that we make. And I would say that an ongoing theme of everything I've learned from you through example over and over and over is I'm going to choose the really difficult but unpopular opinion and try to make some major change or shift no matter what the consequences. So I've, I've seen this, this journey with you even much, because you know, I wasn't even born and all of this was happening. Um, but I've certainly seen this pattern over and over and over of, well, this is kind of dumb the way that we're doing it now, and it's not really right, and it's not really fair. So even if it's not popular, I'm going to try and do something to, to change this. So w w would you say that that's a fair assessment, that that would be a popular script running through your head? Yeah, I guess that's a good way to, to uh, put it. And it. It also comes down to just, just do the right thing. You know, it's, uh, I, don't stop, I don't even stop and think about, well, this may not be popular, this may be this may cause some problems and so forth, although if I think about it, I know that it's true. But I don't even think about it uh, in terms of stirring things up or being a, a rabble rouser. I just think about it's, it, it's the right thing to do. So if it's the right thing to do, you just do it. And as we, we start to unravel and talk about your background and all the other things we're going to talk about going forwards, it, it's, it becomes much clearer what, what the formative experiences were that led to seeing the world through that prism and all the decisions you make after. This is a, a conversation that I had in depth about my own formative experiences, a very similar interview where I was asked some of these questions that I want to make sure anybody listening, if you want to go through a similar pr process, I will put a link in the show notes. Uh, it's uh, an episode with an uh, author named David Mead, who wrote the book, Find Your Why, and really identifying what these formative experiences are that drive you to make the decisions that you do that wrote these scripts can be incredibly helpful. And the reason I say that is that when I look at one of the most dominant scripts that I use subconsciously all the time is exactly the same thing. It's the reason I'm doing this podcast now is there are things that need to be said that are not part of the popular opinion or part of the, the culture of what I do as an industry. But if we're going to make things right, these things need to be talked about. And that's exactly what's happening on a cultural and a global level right now. We're finally – I think people are realizing, you know, maybe it's time we actually start talking about this and listening to the right people and doing something because it just isn't right. But, you know, it, it starts with one person that gets that message. And the, I guess what really blows my mind is that, like, you, you didn't grow up with social media. You didn't even grow up with television. Like you said, in the, the early beginnings, you didn't even have radio. So it just seems like such a foreign concept that you wouldn't even know what a black person is during the most formative years of your life, and then your first response is, oh, that's cool, as opposed to, ooh, that's somebody different for me, and I need to stay away from them or treat them differently. Like, that, that fascinates me, the way that just the, the human brain works and the, just the, the formative years and how, how that can happen, which to me just tells me it's all about none of these things are genetic. It's all about what, what you're taught and what you're brought up to believe. So, I mean, I could go down that rabbit hole forever, but I want to keep, do want to keep going and transition back to where this whole conversation thread started, but from a slightly different lens. What is the most important lesson that you learned from your mom? 
Oh, boy. Well, my mother and my father were really very different. I, I think probably the, the most important lesson I learned from my mother was uh, the seriousness uh, of work. She, for decades and decades and decades that I can remember, she got up at uh, five o'clock every morning and worked all day long. And I had everything done in the house and, and breakfast started so that she could go out to the barn and do the milking and come back in and have breakfast on the table. I uh, I was at home. I was at home for uh, 20 years growing up and never once, never once in 20 years did she fail to not have breakfast on the table at eight o'clock in the morning and what we used to call dinner. We always had dinner at noon, and at five o'clock at night, we had supper uh, before we went out and milked the cows. So for 20 years, uh, we had we had breakfast at eight o'clock, dinner at 12 o'clock, and supper at five, and never once did she miss having a full meal ready on time for 20 years, ever. So she was, she was an unbelievably, unbelievably hard worker, unbelievably reliable. And just did it. it. Was you just did it because that's that's what your job was. So you did your job. So really, the if we were to extract the lesson, it, it just sounds like it's a matter of consistency, following through, sticking with your word, which is very similar to a lot of what you learned from your father as well. Obviously, it, it is related, but somehow it was different. My my mother my mother worried about all of the things that were required on the schedule that had to be done on time. And my father, my father uh, didn't worry about it. He just, he just did what needed to be done, but uh, he, he, he didn't, he didn't worry nearly as much about uh, the rigor and and, uh, the requirement of doing the, the work that needed to be done like my mother did. So which one do you think you're closer to? Which one am I more like? Uh, not in general, just specifically when it comes to this idea of one of them was really worried about always following through and the, the calendar and the requirements and the commitments really drove them. And the other one was like, eh, I'll get it done. Be- between the two of those, which one do you relate to more? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And I could sit and contemplate on it for a long time, and I'm not sure I'd be able to answer it even after thinking about it for a long time. But the truth be known, I suspect that the most honest answer is I came out being about halfway between, and, and I probably I probably took about half from each. So I, I didn't really go one way or the other. I kind of I kind of took from both sides, and 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 the combination of the two, I'm probably halfway in between. Yeah, as a, an observer of uh, just shortly over forty years, I would concur with that. I would put you right about smack dab in the middle of that spectrum, where it's not quite one extreme to the other, but there there are certainly pieces of both in there. So the the next question, uh, along the lines of both your mom and your dad, let's say that both of your parents were still alive today, and I could sit them down in the living room. And they could have a conversation with my kids, their great grandchildren. What do you think they'd want to share with them? That's an interesting question. I I can't think. Neither one of them were talkers. We uh, we lived pretty much a silent life, and I can I can remember, uh, like I said, we never missed a meal, three meals a day for twenty years, and I can remember uh, it was very very common to go through a meal. And having a very enjoyable, a comfortable, pleasant meal together, and uh, nobody ever talked. We we were not talkers. They were not talkers, and so I didn't become one. And so, in fact, it's it's interesting. I had a chat with my two siblings, my brother and my sister, just within the last week, and my brother mentioned that that's that's the way we were. That we really we really don't feel the necessity of carrying on a conversation or holding up our end of the conversation or talking. And he talked about sometimes now with his kids, sometimes their family gets together and they'll have an enjoyable time together. And a bunch of them, you know, big family, maybe four or five, six or seven of them will get together and sit in a living room or wherever 
and they'll just sit and, and enjoy each other and sit with each other for half an hour, an hour, and not feel obligated to talk. And they just enjoy sitting with each other and nobody talks and, they, and nobody's uncomfortable or thinks they, they have to say something. They just enjoy being together. And that's pretty much the way I was raised. So, so you can imagine the, uh, the shock and awe that I had when uh, I married into a Jewish family. And <laughs> That that that's that's not a part of their repertoire. So I'm 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 told by everybody in my wife's family, your husband is so quiet. He's so quiet. Well, if they listen to this interview now, they're gonna they're gonna understand where that comes from because that's that's certainly a lot more of the the life that I remember growing up was uh, not a whole lot of conversation. Um, you just you wake up. Uh, or your father wakes you up by screaming up the stairs and telling you it's time to go to work, and you put on your work clothes and you do the work, and that's it. Um, but somehow, even without all the extra talking, you still uh, still learn a lot of good lessons about life. So interesting. Yep. How Despite the fact that they're not talkers, I'm assuming that if they had the opportunity to sit down and meet with my kids, they would probably say something. So any idea what both of them might be willing to share, even if it was just one sentence apiece? Probably, probably it be, would be putting into a sentence the things that I have already mentioned. The, the, the sentence from my father was the, uh, the most important thing in the world is the way you treat everybody. Uh, you, you, treat, you treat everybody in the world exactly the way you'd like to be treated yourself. And that's the kind of person you are. And there is nothing more important in life than, than how you treat people. Probably. Probably my mother's message would be something about why you have to be responsible and, and whatever your responsibilities are, you, you do what you're sp- responsible for do and do the, do the work that needs to be done and make sure, you, make sure you do whatever has to be done and take care of it. Well, between those two, that's a, that's a pretty powerful combination, I think, for becoming successful in just about any field or with any relationship uh, across the board. So at this point, we're going to make a little bit of a transition. We're going to go from talking more, less about family, background, upbringing, growing up, and we want, I want to transition a little bit more to the, the career side of things and becoming an adult and going out into the world. So we've kind of gone back and forth to the point where the, the audience knows that you were in the Navy in your early 20s. You talked a little bit about uh, that. But once you got out of the Navy, what path did you begin on in life when you first became an adult, got out of the Navy, and why did you choose that path? Uh, the path that I chose uh, kind of chose me, I guess. But the path I chose when I got out of the Navy was being lost. And I had no idea. I had no idea what I could do or what I wanted to do or what I wanted to become. And it was, it was kind of by chance that I uh, started going to college and thought, thought I would uh, check out being a teacher. I wasn't, didn't have the passion for being a teacher and didn't know all my life that I wanted to be one. But I had been exposed to it. My older sister was a teacher, an aunt was a teacher, my mother had been a teacher. And so there was some educators in the family. And so I actually started to college, uh, not knowing for sure where I was going. And just because it was something I was familiar with, I did get into education. And it really, it really wasn't until I had been Uh, in education and uh, connected to schools and teaching for a while that it really, it really hooked me. And I, I decided that I was a teacher and that's what I was going to do with my life. And, and basically I've I've had, I've had a few side trips here and there out of the education world, but for the most part, uh, I have put in pretty close to pretty close to 60 years as a teacher. And uh, I, I have considered myself nothing but a teacher uh, for many, many, many decades. And I have done just about every phase of it, from being a classroom teacher, taught every grade from kindergarten through 12th grade, and I have uh, about 40 years of classroom teaching. I've been an elementary principal and a middle school principal and a high school principal. And I've taught uh, education at the university level 
and um, I still spend uh, I still spend probably uh, oh probably somewhere around 50 60 hours a week teaching yet so I've, I've I am a teacher I've always been a teacher and I guess at this point I'll always be a teacher yeah I don't I don't see that changing fundamentally at this point um, and uh, one of the things to add to that you that you failed to mention is you weren't just an elementary school principal a middle school principal and a high school principal you were my elementary school principal and my middle school principal and my high school principal. So I was the principal's kid. (laughs) I could talk for hours about that. Probably feels a little differently now than it did then. Uh, certainly, yes, it certainly does now. And, uh, they're, they're looking back, you know, in hindsight with my rose colored glasses, I can see all of the wonderful, amazing life lessons that came from it. But, um, during not so much, uh, but that, 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 that's not the subject of this conversation. But yes, I, I could talk about that for hours and I may have with a therapist already. Who knows? <laughs> um, but what, what I, what I want to talk a little bit more about now, and then I want to go way back to the beginning again is when you say you're a teacher now, I would say that, uh, this is partly because of your overly humble nature. I think you're underselling yourself. What I want people to understand is that you are known as one of your industry niches foremost experts, not just being a general teacher, but talk to me and talk to the audience specifically about what you are literally one of the best in the world at doing. Well, gosh, I hope to pick I hope I pick the one you're thinking about. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with sheep, if you're wondering. <laughs> I I hope you're thinking about reading. Uh yes. Because uh and there there's an interesting story goes with this. From the time I was a young teacher, uh, and I started out as an elementary classroom teacher, and I, th- I thought I was pretty good. The kids liked me and the parents liked me, and I was having fun and enjoying teaching. And I thought, gosh, this, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm a good teacher. And I began, at the time, I was teaching fifth grade. And uh, I noticed that every year, the fourth grade teachers would send me new fifth graders for the next year. Usually in those days, it was about 30 new students. And I noticed that every year they sent me about 10, 12 kids that were really, really very poor students and were not able to read at a fifth grade. In fact, many of them read at like a a second, third grade level or, or maybe a fourth grade level at best. And then they had me. Then they had me for a whole year, the wonderful teacher, and they had a great year and they loved me and I loved them and we had fun. And I began to notice after a few years of that, that when they left me, they left me two and three and four years below grade level in reading. And I began to think, if I'm such a good teacher, how come these kids aren't getting better? How come, how come I'm not able to teach them reading so I catch them up in reading? And that began to bother me. And so I started asking other people and principals and university people and so forth. And what am I doing wrong? And what do I need to do differently? How come, how come I can't get my kids caught up in reading? And the first thing I found out was that nobody else knew either. Uh, people at the university, people in administration, it was happening to kids everywhere. And people said things and tried things and tried to sell things. But for the most part, it wasn't working for anybody. And so I literally, I literally went on a worldwide quest, begging people to talk to me if they thought they knew anything about helping kids who were poor and reading. And it really took a number of years. And I started doing some things and getting some results and got a little bit better at it. But it really, it really took decades before all of the things that I discovered and all the things that I tried uh, started to work. And uh, I learned a few things here and a few things there. And a number of things I discovered on my own. And uh, I have gone from being the teacher that didn't do the kids who are struggling readers any good at all to being the person who can do but some people think nothing short of a miracle and taking kids who are struggling readers and really helping them and changing their lives 
and making them into good readers. So I, I uh, have a reputation for dealing with what we call hard cases. Uh, these are kids who are uh, in some cases, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and they really never learn to read. In some cases, in, in middle school, they're still reading at a kindergarten level or just not reading at all. And I have been able to take hard cases that are three, four, and five years below grade level in reading and actually get them caught up to an above grade level in reading, which for the most part is uh, what you would consider not too much short of a miracle. And it's very hard work and it takes some time and there's a lot of tricks to it, but it's probably, it's probably one of the most influential and one of the most important things that I've done in my life and still continuing to do it about 50 hours a week. Well, and there's no doubt that uh, from, from me seeing this whole journey progress and um, getting you from doing it in the one-room schoolhouse to doing it in a larger schoolhouses to the day coming when you and I sat down and I taught you how to do tutoring via Zoom calls, um, which you're now doing, which means that you can essentially tutor anybody in reading anywhere in the world they have an internet connection. Um, I've, I've seen firsthand, uh, it really is with some of these kids a miracle. And I just, I want to emphasize one other point before we move on, because I think this is a really, really important one that's going to help us answer the next questions. When you say struggling readers, again, I think maybe you're underselling both the severity of what some people are coming to you with and the abilities that you have to overcome that, where it's not just a matter of I'm behind grade level. We're talking about not just one diagnosed type of dyslexia. We're often talking about two different types of dyslexia, which most people aren't even aware exist. And certainly anybody that knows they both exist would say, well, anybody that has both of them simultaneously, they're a lost cause. And on top of that, people that have autism and other learning disabilities, and somehow you run them through your little system and they just come out being readers. I have said this many times. It is so simple. Once you really understand how it works, to me, it's so simple. And everybody thinks it's so complex that they try to come up to these complex things. And so what looks like the most complex thing in the world, when you really boil it down and you figure it out, it really is very simple. Uh, but everybody's looking for something that's so complex that they think nobody else can see it. But yeah, it, it, you were right about it being a very complex situation because the, the things you mentioned can be different types of dyslexia and it can be autism. And quite commonly, it also involves ADHD and ADD at the same time. And of course, the other thing that happens if a kid is in school for six years and he's reading at a first grade reading level, he's got some, he's got some self-concept problems and in many cases has developed an attitude and decided that uh, nobody's going to teach him and, and uh, that he, he's given up on the world. And, it, and in fact, it's ironic that you should mention what it leads to, because if you look at uh, the prison populations, it is documented and has been tested that the vast majority, the vast majority, I'm not talking 30, 40 percent, I'm talking like 70 percent. The 70% of the people who are incarcerated in prison in this country have significant reading problems, and the vast majority of them are dyslexic. And that's another population that could be fixed. So all of that having been said, talking about what it is that you do, who the people are that you serve, what is it that you love the most about what you do and why? Oh, that's, that's a simple... <laughs> What I love is what you see. It's it's like you like you said. It's you change people's lives. You you have kids who have given up on themselves. Uh, they're angry, and uh, they have nothing to live for. And you see them come out of their shell and become happy and and enjoy life and enjoy learning and enjoy reading. You literally save kids' lives. And uh, you see him, see him become a real person, a happy person, uh, contributing member to society when they had absolutely no hope. 
Well, I think that what often gets lost in the thought about teaching and is something that I know that you do with something that I do with my coaching and mentorship as well. And once again, no coincidence whatsoever where all this came from. Um, it took me a lot of digging and years to really figure out what is this machine inside that's subconsciously driving me to make these choices that I don't understand. And I realized that machine is on the other end of my microphone right now. Um, but the, I think that w- what a lot of people miss when it comes to teaching and what really makes a great teacher and the service that you sell and the service that I sell, it's not teaching vowels and sight words and paragraphs and reading comprehension. Those are all the, the pieces of it. But what what you really provide and is the, the, the number one key that I think comes with any great teaching is you give people confidence. It's, it's not the material. It's not the curriculum. It's a concept I call connecting with the student. It's connecting with the student. They know you care about them. You do literally care about them. And you become part of their life, the most important part of their life. So you are absolutely right. It's, I've, had this, I've had this experience because in my teaching, I've decided that I should reach more people and I ought to have other people that work for me and tutor for me and do the same thing that I do. And for some reason, when I do this, it doesn't seem to work. I, they don't get the same results I do. I thought, what? Why? I actually, I, I mean, I give them the material. They have the same syllabus. They use the same material. They, they use everything that I use, and it doesn't happen. And I thought, well, what's, what's wrong? And, and the answer is, it's not, it's a good curriculum, it's good material, and you have to have that to make it work. But more important, more important than the curriculum is the connecting with the student. You got to really, really connect with the student. And that's what changes kids' lives. So given the impact that you see giving these students confidence and really connecting to them, beyond that, what do you think it is that makes you successful at what you do versus all the other people that are doing this? Well, beyond the, just the connecting and the personal relationships that are developed and the trust and so forth, I have done my homework. Like I said, this, is, this has been uh, 20, 30 years that I've been working on this, and I've left no stone unturned. And I think there are some thinking outside the box kind of things that if I, I couldn't have learned from any experts because none of the experts knew them. So it really, it really is a matter of being a keen observer and uh, seeing something that's working and changing. It's not like I came up with this great system 15, 20 years ago and adopted it, and I've been doing it for 15 or 20 years. I, I literally, I l- literally see something different, something new, probably every week and change a little bit or tweak something a little bit. When I see something that works, why I add it to the routine or change it a little bit. So it, it really is a matter of being a very keen observer and being open-minded and not, not being uh, stuck to any mindset or any curriculum or any system and always being alert and on, on the lookout for something that's working. I can change a little bit or tweak a little bit. And it's going to make things better, make a difference. Doesn't sound terribly uh, dissimilar from perhaps going back to this idea of scripts, the uh, the script that I run all day, every day, which is how can I take this thing and get just a little bit better at this, get just a little bit better at that and be aware and observe and iterate and dare I say, optimize. Um, so once again, I'm learning a lot about where all of these scripts are coming from that drive this machine that's inside my brain all day long. Um, makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, kind of the, the final question that I have in general about work and careers is that we've talked a lot about teaching. 
So for anybody that's listening to just this interview that doesn't know you, they can picture a very linear path where you went to school to learn education, you've been through all these various areas in teaching, and now you're doing the, the reading tutor and instruction via Zoom. Makes a lot of sense. There's a whole lot of gaps in there that have absolutely nothing to do with teaching where you have gone off the beaten path and you have pursued your own endeavors, whether it be uh, taking a hand at being a stockbroker or running a direct marketing company or starting a farm um, that has sheep and beef cattle or being a strawberry farmer or just a regular vegetable blueberry farmer. Like there, there are so many things that you have done outside this realm of teaching. And I say all of that, not necessarily to talk about all of those, but this next question, I think will include all of that beyond just the teaching. So the question is a two-part question. What do you believe about yourself that helps you endure difficult times? And what is the most difficult experience or experiences that you remember that taught you those lessons? Oh, that's a hard question. I guess the reason I have dabbled in so many things is because I like to think that uh, I'm creative and uh, really am interested in everything and want to dabble some things and try some things. So it was never a matter of wanting to be a farmer instead of being a teacher or wanting to start a business instead of being a teacher. It was, it was always, uh, I was, I've always been a teacher, but I was out of the classroom and out of the school building for some period of time. But uh, I always knew, I always knew whatever I was dabbling in and what I'm interested in, uh, I was always a teacher. And, and that has not changed. I, uh, I am in the process of uh, uh, looking into stocking my pond with bluegills so that I'll be able to get bluegills. I'm actually uh, planting some strawberries this week to try a new variety of strawberries. Actually, I just got a couple of lambs and then I'm developing, uh, developing uh, my own breed of sheep, basically. And uh, in the process of uh, construct or, uh, designing and uh, building a treehouse, and I'm actually looking at the uh, possibility of uh, building a house on top of the two silos on the farm. Now, that's, that's not because I don't think I'm a teacher. Or I want to do something besides be a teacher. But the, the creativity and the interest and the excitement and everything in life is always there. Uh, and really, really being interested in all those things is not because I don't want to be a teacher or I don't want to put all of my time and energy into being a teacher, but I'm just, I just like to think that there are so many exciting, creative things that are worthwhile in life. And I'm just interested in them and want to be involved in them. I, uh, for anybody that's, that's listening, that started picturing the, the farm boy that goes out to be in the Navy and then become a teacher and has been a teacher for 50 years. And they hear you talking about, building houses on top of silos and creating your own breed of sheep. They're like, wait, what's going on? And I just smiled. I'm like, yep, sounds about right. <laughs> sounds pretty much like a typical day in the Arnold household. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely, definitely used to all of those ideas. Um, so I love the way that you frame that. I think that it's really important for people to hear. I have multiple clients um, that just cannot figure out what is the path that I'm supposed to be on in life. And I need you to tell me what's the one thing that I meant to do. And the realization they often come to is that there isn't one thing. There's a whole bunch of things that they're interested. It's not what you're doing. It's why you're doing it that's consistent. So the, the why is the most important part. Once again, going to this, this bigger picture of why, and uh, um, I will direct people to the show notes again for that same episode that I did with David Mead. It's a fundamental part of my coaching and mentorship program. But once you identify why you make the choices that you do, the what becomes so simple. And uh, I, I think that uh, it's okay to say, well, I am a teacher at heart, but I'm also going to create my own breed of sheep. And I'm also going to cross pollinate strawberries. And like there it's, it's okay to do all those things as long as uh, you really believe why you're doing it and, and you, can, you can see that one clear path. However, I don't think we answered the question yet. I think this is a really important question to answer. So now that we've, uh, we've given a little bit more backstory to all of that, knowing all of the things you've been involved with and have tried out over the years, what is it at your core that you believe about yourself 
that helps you endure the difficult times, the ideas that fail, or just a- any of the, the, the less pleasant parts of your life that you can remember? And what experiences do you think encapsulate those things that you believe about yourself? I, I know what I would say, but I want to hear what you would say about this. Gosh, that, that's hard to put into words. It, ne- it never occurred to me to think about it or figure out why. It's just, it's just the way it is. I am so interested in everything. I think it boils down to some kind of innate confidence. I mean, it would never occur to me that there'd be something come up that I wouldn't be able to do. It's a matter of I decided I want to do it. I mean, if I decided I wanted to, to be a, a brain surgeon or I decided I wanted to be a rocket scientist or I decided I wanted to do anything, it, it, would, never, it would never occur to me that I couldn't do it. It's, it's a matter of what, what do I want to do? What am I interested in? I'm not held back by restraints about do you have the ability or would you be able to do this? By whatever it is, I, it's a matter of that's what I'd like to do, what I'm interested in doing, what I want to do with my time and my life. It's not a matter of am I, do I have the ability to do it. I just always know that I, could, I can do anything I want to do. It's just a matter of deciding what I want to do. So if I, if I were to boil that down to maybe a, a sentence or a phrase, and it was this idea of what you really believe about yourself at your core, it would essentially be, I'm capable of doing anything that I set my mind to. That, that's, I, I couldn't have said it any better. Well, that's you a- have. You've only said it about 400 times. So that's why it was easy for me to put together. <laughs> Because I've only been hearing that my entire life. So I'm, again, I'm trying to get to the core of all of this and where it really comes from and how we can identify these patterns in our thoughts and our behaviors that shape us and use, the, use those patterns to our advantage. So it's easy for me to say that sentence because you may not be able to think of what it is off the top of your head, but I've heard that over and over and over and over. Like, I, I don't know how many other fathers did this with uh, their kids in the early to mid 80s, but basically the movie Back to the Future became standard curriculum on life with you. Yep. How many times have you quoted lines in that movie, not because they're funny or it's a movie, but because it's the way you should look at life? Yep. And that's one of them, right? Yes. Um, and it's also this idea, well, what, what's the other quote that you've probably used from Back to the Future 87 million times with me and your students? Oh, oh, yeah. Where we're going, there are no roads. All about paving your own path and not being afraid to, to step forwards and go ahead, right? In fact, I do a mantra. At the end of every single, I teach all of the kids that I tutor, I teach them one lesson a week. And the last thing that we do with every kid, every lesson I ever teach, is the last thing I say to them is, what is the most important thing I have taught you? And they have all learned and they all say on cue, I am very, very, very smart. And there is nothing in this world that I cannot do. That is said by every student. And that includes the students that start out reading at a kindergarten level when they're in seventh grade. That's the last thing they say at every lesson I ever teach. And why do you think, and I'm so glad you said that because that was going to be my next question anyways. I wanted to make sure people were aware of that. Why do you think that works better than the best curriculum you can get at Kumon Learning School or all these other test prep dyslexia specialists? Why does that make the difference? The the big difference in life, you, you you have to believe. And so I'm not sure the best way to teach people to believe but I do my best at it, and that's part of it. But the reason, the reason the kids that I get get better is because they believe me. And then they, after a while, they begin to believe in themselves. And they get better because they believe that they can get better. Well, I'm, a, I'm assuming you're familiar with the psychological concept of faking it till you make it, correct? Yes. And there's a lot of science, and you can probably speak to this more than I could, uh, because I think I I don't know anything about reading specifically, but when it comes to brain development and neuroscience and personal development, I think you and I probably have a lot of the same books on our bookshelves. But there's a fair amount of science that speaks to how efficacious it is to fake it until you make it, because you can literally take something that you don't believe in yourself 
and do it over and over and over. And then all of a sudden you realize, I actually believe this now. And you're, you're seeing that firsthand. That's exactly what happens. You start, you say it long enough and you start experiencing it long enough. And after a while it becomes real and, and you believe it and it becomes part of you. Well, I would say that we're, we're probably through the, the first half of this conversation. Um, the, the next half of it is going to be talking a little bit more about family, being a parent, uh, lessons of being a parent, stuff like that, and then just general life stuff. Um, but I know that uh, you, you have uh, other students and other people that are waiting for you. So we're, we're going to schedule a part two very, very much in the near future. And hopefully by the time somebody's listening to part one, Part two will already be available and they can just continue listening to this conversation. But for some reason, um, I'm not able to make that happen in time. I will leave us at part one. But what I want to make sure is uh, for anybody that's listening to this right now, that's thinking, you know what? I have a child that is struggling with reading and I've been told there's no hope or I believe that there's no hope or I just can't find the resources. Um, I want to reiterate um, that even though you're on this little tiny farm in the middle of nowhere in northern Wisconsin, there's this thing called the internet and this thing called Zoom. And you've even worked with people that have children in California and all over the country. Um, so talk actually, to me. Actually, all over the world. I've had students in Japan and China and uh, Nicaragua. So, yeah, we've actually had New Zealand. I didn't know you were teaching Mandarin. So, so you can teach reading in Mandarin. That, that's, that's I can't a new skill teach in Mandarin, but I, I, I've, uh, I've had English-speaking clients in uh, probably about six different countries. Wow, I, I wasn't even aware of that. I didn't know that you had gone international. So good for you. Well, uh, for anybody that's listening that uh, both was just inspired in general by listening to this conversation, but more specifically, um, that actually has a, a child that might be struggling with reading, tell me a little bit more about uh, just the, the Arnold Reading Clinic uh, what you do, how it works, and where they can find you and contact you. Uh, actually, they can get me. They can get to me on the internet by just my email. Uh, they can reach me at Arnold School, all one word, Arnold School at yahoo.com. or you can find me at my website and get information about what I do on the website. And the website is Arnold Reading Clinic, all one word, Arnold Reading Clinic. Dot com. Fantastic. Uh, well, I will, I'll, I'll bid you adieu for, for this time. And then as soon as we get off this recording, I'm going to schedule another one so we can get the, the second half of this in the can. But this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. And like I said, it's no coincidence that I'm doing it uh, around Father's Day. And I think it's, uh, it's an important conversation to, to learn more about the people that helped form who you are. And uh, ultimately, just uh, thank you for the person that you are. So I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate you for being a, a, a huge driving force in helping me become the person that I have. So. Just remember, what's the most important thing I have taught you? You are very, very, very smart. And there is nothing in this world that you cannot do. And where I'm going... There are no roads. Where you're going, there are no roads. Exactly. Well, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time today and uh, looking forward to doing part two. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this very special episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next interview like this one, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. And again, as a quick reminder, if you enjoyed the first part of this interview, I discussed the following 10 questions in part two, which can be found either in your podcast app of choice or by visiting optimizeyourself.me slash episode 109. And by the way, just to give him one more completely shameless plug, if you are the parent of a child who struggles with reading, yes, I'm going to be biased saying this, but my father is literally a miracle worker. If you want to contact him, visit arnoldreadingclinic.com. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, healthy, and sane, and be well.